<laughs> oh, it's Matt's fault. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wake up! <laughs> no. I'm going to start again since nobody could hear us at, uh, at, at home. So today we're talking about living life fully awake. Hopefully you got that. That's the third time you've heard it. So living life fully awake. And, uh, you know, people, they wake up differently. Some people use the snooze alarm, and then they reset it. They use it again. Other people, uh, they wake up and get out of bed as soon as the alarm goes off. And then there are people who, uh, they wake up automatically all the time. Even if they're on vacation, they, they wake up at whatever that time is, 5 in the morning. They wake up because their body clock wakes them up. They don't even need an alarm clock. Um, and so I won't ask you which you are. <laughs> <laughs> but people wake up differently. And today we're talking about being fully awake uh, in life because you can go to sleep. And so we're going to look at uh, three things that uh, Paul talks about, about how we walk, walk in love, walk in light, walk in wisdom. And that's how he has organized these verses. I, I mean, that's how he has written his, his letter here is he talks about walking in love and then walking in light or walking as light and then walking in wisdom. Uh, and in the middle of this, is uh, this song, Wake Up. Let's go ahead and uh, look at Ephesians 5, the first uh, six verses. If you go ahead and stand, I'll read those. Ephesians 5, 1 through 6. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity and covetousness must not be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral, impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience." And God's people said, amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. So these are the verses that, that talk about walking in love. And we are described here as being uh, children, beloved children. And God is our Father. We're also described as being uh, saints. And uh, you may feel that those aren't descriptions that, you know, especially the saints one. Most of us don't walk around thinking, I'm a saint. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's what the Bible says. We are saints set apart uh, in Christ. That's who we are when we put our faith in Jesus. We are in God's family. He is our Father, and we are beloved children. He loves us dearly. And so Paul is going to spend some time encouraging the Ephesians about walking in love. And of course, the model for that, the person we follow, is Jesus. Verse 1, he says, uh, you know, imitate God. And then he says, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. So God is our Father. We're supposed to imitate him. And uh, that's a natural impulse. Some of you have experienced that as uh, parents or grandparents where your child copied you. They looked at how you were sitting and then they copied that. Or they wanted, to, they wanted you to uh, teach them to shave when they were four because you were shaving. <laughs> they wanted to imitate you. And uh, that's what this is talking about here, is you imitate your father. Uh, you see how he does it, and you, you see the things that are important to him, and you want to do that. And then he talks about walking in love as Christ went to the cross and gave himself up for us. That's, um, that's our example, the example of Jesus, the one we follow when we think about love. And so that's, <laughs> that's how this uh, chapter begins, imitating God and... and uh, following Jesus. Now, this is, of course, it's a new year. They didn't get to hear me. Happy New Year there at home. <laughs> Happy New Year. It's good to, good to be together. Are you ready for a better year? Yes, I am. And so we have a new year ahead of us. And this uh, scripture will give us a, a good way to start the year and think about uh, our life and where we have been headed and where we're headed in the time coming up this year and uh, making the best use of our time that we have. So we already have one day down, right, this year. This is not a leap year, is it? Okay, so we have 364 left. And we're going to talk about making good use of time in just a little bit. So first is um, walking in love. We spent a lot of time 
in the last few weeks talking about what that means. Here, Paul is going to uh, focus on some negative things that can pull you off track. In verse 3, he says, sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not be named among you as is proper among the saints. He's saying, you have been set apart, you're a saint, you are a follower of Jesus, he, he laid his life down for you, you have been for, your sins have been forgiven, it's your Father, God, that you're imitating, and so the definition of your life should not be lust and covetousness, that should not be what defines you as a person. When people think about Steve Briner, they should not think, oh yeah, he's a very lustful, covetous person. Now, I might struggle with those things, but because I'm human, but that shouldn't like, be the whole definition of who I am, like the direction of my life, like where I'm headed, the most important thing to me. Um, the Bible makes pretty clear that when you covet something, like whatever that is, your neighbor's car, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's house, that thing you're coveting has become a what? An idol. It replaces God. You're discontent, and you feel you will only be happy if you have your neighbor's house, your neighbor's job, your neighbor's car, your neighbor's wife. Then you would be happy. And so that thing represents happiness to you, and you become fixated on it. That's covetousness. You become unhappy unless you have that. And so that has become God to you, that thing. That um, has become an idol. And this is, Paul is getting at the heart of this. You are a child of God who loves you deeply. Imitate him. You are following Jesus who laid his life down for you. That's how you walk in love. You don't have to lust after things or people in order to be happy. God your Father loves you. Jesus, his son, has given his life for you. The spirit lives within. There is a peace and a contentment that can occur in your heart where you don't have to be driven to try to be happy by getting these things in your life, coveting what other people have, lusting after uh, these things or these relationships. That doesn't have to be the center of your life. And so he encourages them not to do that. And in verse 4, he says, Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. And we're going to talk about thanksgiving in the next couple of weeks a little bit more. But I want you to notice, it's kind of a surprise, actually, those of you who wrestle with sexual temptations and, you know, you, you feel like you won't be happy unless you have more stuff and your life is filled with impurity, what you ought to do is be thankful. And I think sometimes people might read this and be disappointed, like, I want something more energetic or powerful to combat these things. I mean, lust is powerful enemy in my life, and covetousness is this huge enemy thing that I struggle against, and, and there's impurity all around me. How is Thanksgiving going to help? Well, what do you focus on when you're thankful? The one who gave you things, your father, uh, Jesus who gave his life for you, and you're thankful for, for what has been given. You know that you have been created in God's image, that he loves you, that he cares for you, that even through hard times, he's with you, that Jesus knows all about hard times. He died on a cross, uh, that the Spirit is with you no matter what, that you belong to him, that you are his child, that you, um, this thankful attitude puts your focus on God and off of the other things. It's a powerful thing, thanksgiving. And when it operates in our life, it does change things. Uh, I had a conversation once with uh, a lady who, her marriage was failing actually, but she expressed regret that she had not pursued uh, sports in college and had gone on to get a sports scholarship and maybe even played, you know, professional, and she regretted that. And what I asked her is, well, do you love your children? Well, yes, they're my life. Well, you know, you wouldn't have had them if you did that. You wouldn't have met your husband. Well, we're getting divorced. I know that. But your children wouldn't exist. I mean, life is full of disappointments and sorrows and things that haven't worked out the way you hoped that they had. I mean, that's the definition of life. But these children, who you just said is your life, they wouldn't be here if you had pursued sports and gotten a scholarship and went on professionally. I mean, you might have other children. Would, that be a, would you be okay with that if you had other kids? Now, before you, you can't automatically say that to everybody because I knew she loved her kids. <laughs> but she very much changed her attitude. Instead of regretting this choice, 
of not pursuing sports and regretting having married this person was able to put it in perspective. I would not have my children who I deeply love without those things in my life. And I am thankful for the blessing of my children, even though that came with these disappointments. Thankfulness can completely change the way you think about things. But if your attitude is one of lust, I must get something to please myself, and covetousness, I need to grab what someone else has, then I'll be happy, you will never be happy. You can't find contentment in that. The very definition of lust is wanting somebody like for your own pleasure, not love. Maybe you've noticed the opposite thing that's going on here is Paul says walk in love, not in like sexual immorality, like lust. Lust is an opposite of love. Lust is not love. Uh, and it becomes an idol, covetousness. Uh, instead, imitate your father. And in verse 4, he talks about it should show up in the way you talk, the jokes you tell, the, w- the way your language works, your love for your father, and your thanksgiving for the uh, Jesus who laid his life down for you should show up in what you talk about. He's not saying you're not allowed to laugh. He's not saying that. He's just saying the way you laugh, the things that you, the stories you share with other people, it should show that you're a child of God, that you follow Jesus. That should seem obvious. And it, it's jarring when it's not working right. I've noticed this on Facebook sometimes. People will post things and they'll use foul language or, or really foul images, and someone will post on their site, I thought you followed Jesus. <laughs> and I thought, all right. <laughs> Maybe they'll listen to this person who sometimes isn't even a Christian. This person who isn't even a follower of Jesus pointing out to them, I thought you followed Jesus. How can you make your point that way? It's not the position whatever it is, the the opinion, it's the way it's presented. And this person is shocked. I thought you, I thought you followed Jesus. How can you post it that way? And that's what Paul is getting at. When you're a follower of Jesus, uh, when you say things, it should look like it, sound like it. That's what he's saying. Uh, Verse 5, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral, impure, or who is covetous, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now, this can be a difficult verse, I think, especially for teenagers to read, and there'll be more teenagers in the next service, but there's some in this one, so I'm going to talk about this. These are the kind of verses that can make a teenager feel like, well, then I can never be in the kingdom of God, because God can see what I'm thinking, and there's no way that that's pure. (laughs) I have, I have lots of things in, going around in my head or lots of things I'm struggling with, and I am absolutely not. I don't have a handle on this at all. I have all these um, sexual desires that are just inside of, inside of me that I, I just don't have any control over, and I, I feel like I'm just not a good person. Do you remember feeling that way as a teenager? I'm strange. I'm weird. Nobody's probably feeling this way except me. Do some of you remember that? Some of you are like, man, I was a teenager. That was 60 years ago. <laughs> but I remember, I remember what it was like. This kind of verse would bother me when I was 16 because I would feel like it's something I can't live up to. So now let's look, before I say what I'm going to say, let's, let's go on here. Verse 6 says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So first, I'm going to say this. You have to take the word seriously. There is such a thing as being a child of disobedience, and that defines who you are. We all sin. We are all disobedient at some point. But when Paul says a son of disobedience or a child of disobedience, it means that pretty much defines who you are totally. (laughs) So when you hear that God is your father, you're not happy about it. When God says, this is my will for you, you want to do the opposite even if you wish you could do that, just because you're, you're honorary about it. And when um, Paul is warning you about the dangers of sexual immorality or impurity or um, dirty jokes or coarse talking, um, your response is more like, I'm all into that. That's awesome. I want that guy's car. 
And I want that relationship, and I'm willing to do what's wrong to get that relationship, and that's what I'm all about. That's a child of disobedience. Um, And you have to take that seriously because our actions count. We watched this year, one of my favorite movies uh, this time of year is It's a Wonderful Life. And he wished he had never been born. And he found out, hey, your life has an impact. There's a line from that movie, you know, um, every man on that transport uh, ship died. And and George Bailey says, "Uh uh-uh, my brother saved every man on that transport. And the angel says, actually, since you never existed, you weren't there to save your brother. So every man, he wasn't there to save the transport. Your actions have consequences, both good and bad so that your actions and your words um, count. And what would you expect from the Word of God other than warning about if you pursue a life of lust and impurity and greed, this will negatively impact your life and the lives of those around you, and it makes your father angry. (laughs) God's wrath. That should not surprise you, right? Just think about your own earthly father or mother if they learned that you took a sledgehammer and broke into a store and stole some televisions and sold it, would they be happy about that? No. What would you hope your parents' response is? That they're mad. That, <laughs> that your behavior is, is awful. That, you know, you need to be saved from this kind of, that's this language here. When the Bible says God is your father, it's not all just... Um, How do I say this? It's not just all warm and fuzzy. God is your father. La, 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 la. God is your father also means God is your father. (laughs) Okay. That thing you did, man, is he unhappy about that? And you have to let the weight of these words settle in where you realize actually that behavior or that way of speaking probably makes my father upset. God's my father. It dishonors him. It's a total lack of disrespect to him and the people around me. It is, uh, actually, I'm ignoring that he loves me. I'm running away from his love. I am ignoring the fact that Jesus laid his life down for me on the cross. I'm acting as if that doesn't matter. My behavior is awful. I should want God to call me on that. Uh, That's what Paul is getting at here. But now I'm going to move to talking to teenagers where you read a verse like this and you think, well, I'm out. I can't possibly be good enough. I want to give you some encouragement in this. Because Paul says, you know, nobody who's sexually immoral can enter the kingdom of heaven. True. However, (laughs) what do we come up against that is good news for us? God's love and mercy... What is it that Jesus died for on the cross? I, well, I, that was a bad question, but I mean, he died because we sinned. And his death was because of our sin, and his blood pays for our sin. And we are forgiven not because we have cleaned up our act, we're forgiven because God loves us and Jesus' blood paid for our sin. Um, now, that's, those are concepts that are true, but let's talk about uh, people. Now, how about David? Is he in the kingdom of God, King David? According to this verse, he's not, right? Sexually immoral, covetousness. Hey, that that woman's married, but I want her. Willing to commit murder, adultery. So according to this verse, David is not in the kingdom of God. Moses, murderer. Tried to solve the problem on his own without talking to God about it. Matter of fact, when you look through the Bible, you'll find quite a bit of immorality, and, and yet, you know, the nation of Israel itself, Jacob, Jacob's name is changed to Israel, okay? The foundation of the nation of Israel is what? A liar and a cheat who lied to his father to get the inheritance, who told God, hey, yeah, God, if you bless my life, then I'll worship you. That's Jacob. And then what does he, he ends up being married to what? Two sisters? Are you supposed to do that? Nope. And they're servants. He has children by all four women. Does that sound pure to you? No. So is Israel in the kingdom of God, (laughs) Jacob? 
When you read the Bible, you find truth. Here's the truth. We're all sinners. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to make ourselves pure to be in his family. He loves us already. The death of Christ has changed everything. You put your faith in Jesus and you are saved. But being a child of God means you're his child. And that if you're disobedient and you're lustful and you're full of covetousness and you're, you're not following Jesus, you're following the world, who's going to talk to you about that? God, your Father. And it's going to be one of those conversations maybe that you had with your parents. It's going to be like that <laughs> conversation that you had at one time with your mom or dad. And the motivation behind that conversation you had with your mom or dad was not that you would somehow be taken out of this world, but the conversation is to bring you back. That's the conversation that God has with us. So, yes, you cannot have empty words, which an empty word would be sin doesn't matter. Sin does matter. That's why Jesus had to go to the cross. Sin matters. Sin can destroy a life. It can destroy the lives around you. There's something more powerful than sin, though. That's the love of God and the blood of Jesus. And here it says, no sexually immoral people can be, person can be in the kingdom of Christ, and yet you have David. And Judah, actually, the, you know, David is of the tribe of Judah, who went up to town to sleep with the prostitute. You got him, okay? So what I'm trying to say, I am not, I am absolutely not saying sexual sin doesn't matter. What I am saying is that our Father will deal with us because these are serious matters. But the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that it's your Father who loves you who's dealing with you on these issues. And we're being reminded that we are a beloved child of the creator of the universe, and it's Jesus that we follow. That's how we learn to walk in love, the one who went to the cross for us. And at some point in our life, we will deal with these issues. We will become covetous of someone else, their stuff, or a relationship at some point in our life. At some point in our life, we'll be swept into things that are impure. At some point in our life, we'll have a sexual desire that's out of bounds at some point in our life. What's the good news? We have a Father who loves us, Jesus who gave his life for us, we have the Spirit who's a seal on our heart, and we have God speaking to us directly about how we need to <laughs> imitate him, follow Jesus, listen to the Spirit. And uh, so that's encouraging. And I, I just, I wanted to mention that for teenagers because this can be a difficult scripture. Uh, oh, I'll just say this briefly about sexuality as well. Um, guess where sex came from? Yeah, God created it. So we're created as sexual beings, but uh, it's something that we struggle with. Uh, how do we know that? Well, one way is you read the Bible. How much struggle is there in the Bible on that issue? A lot. But we, you know, you as a teenager need to know that that's part of how God made you. But you need to listen to your, your dad follow Jesus, listen to the Spirit, and you'll find peace there and contentment, even if you end up not having everything you wish you had, because none of us get that. No, no person on earth gets all that they wish they had. It does not work out the way all of us wished it would work out. It just does not. So how do you live a life where you're not going to get everything you want and where things aren't going to all work out the way you want with contentment and with thanksgiving. How do you do that? Well, you get closer to God the Father and follow Jesus the Son and listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. All right, so that's, those are some things to think of as we start the new year. Uh, the next section talks about walking as light. Walking in the light, walking as light. Verse 7 says, Therefore do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light. And the Lord walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, 
O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And so we have walk in love, walk in light, or walk as light. Because here we're described as children of the light. We are light, uh, but we also walk in light. We're only light because we reflect the light of Christ. But Jesus talked about this. What did he say to his disciples? You are the light of the world. Well, who is the light of the world? Jesus. He said that at Hanukkah uh, in the Gospel of John. Actually, the only place that Hanukkah is mentioned in all of Scripture, the Feast of Dedication, is in the Gospel of John. And Jesus at that ceremony said, I am the light of the world. And because he's the light of the world, we also are the light of the world, children of light. I really like the song that David was singing for us where it talks about uh, the trees tasted the light. I like that, that line. I appreciated that, the trees tasting light. So Paul says, don't become partners with them. Don't go into business with darkness. You know, that's, that's your old partner. You used to be partners with darkness. Leave that behind. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Now, that line of that song, the trees tasted light, reminded me of this verse, because light produces fruit. You know, how many apples and pears and cherries do you get if you put the tree in utter darkness? Zero. Okay, the, the trees must have light to produce the fruit. And so... Um, the scripture encourages us to understand that as you walk in light, as you're in the light of Christ, that produces fruit. It produces wonderful things for, that please God and please and help others. The fruit of light. And then he talks about the power of light. You know, pow the power of light is that it can expose what is in darkness and it can draw that that used to be in darkness into light. He told them, you used to be in darkness but now you're light. And when you're around other people, that light exposes the darkness that they're in. And you know that can draw them into light as well. And then he says, wake up, awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Now this sounds kind of like Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60 verse 1 says, arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you, and nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Now, it sounds kind of like that, but it's not a quote of that. And if you look through Scripture, you won't find this is not a quote of Scripture, but it sounds like it's informed by Scripture. And as I was studying this, it, uh, most people feel that it's probably a quote of a hymn that was sung possibly when people got baptized, that people came and got baptized, and then the church broke out into singing, and one of the things they sang was, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. It's a, it's a, a little quote of a song that probably everybody knew at the time, and we don't know if that's for sure, but that makes sense. And I've written songs before, and I know that's kind of the songwriting process. As you read a scripture, it inspires you. And then when you write your song with your tune, you kind of adjust the ideas. And, you, and it, it's not an exact quote, but it refers to something. And then people sing it. And they say, hey, that sounds a lot like Isaiah. Yeah, that's what I read when I wrote the song. So I understand that process. It does, that makes sense to me. So when people had come to faith in Christ, it's quite possible that they came to be baptized and they went under the water, they were dead, the darkness was gone, and they rose to new life in Christ, the way he rose from the dead, resurrection, and Christ shines on them. And, you know, this is the encouragement, is to wake up, <laughs> live your life in light, uh, don't keep trying to sleep. Um, I talked to somebody the other day who, uh, yesterday actually, who talked about this and said that, um, you know, life isn't, shouldn't be about sleeping. Now, you need to have enough sleep to be healthy, and people can have their sleep messed with as a part of the illness that they're, they're dealing with. So I, I don't want to make anyone feel guilty about sleep because that can be something you're struggling with. But I thought the point was well taken, is that our purpose on life is not to sleep. You are not a cat, <laughs> okay? I think that's the cat's purpose in life is to sleep. But it's not your purpose. You know, your purpose is to wake up 
and live your life in the light, following Jesus with all your strength. This reminds me of my grandson, uh, J.D., who, um, that's one of his sayings, is, uh, wake up, the sun is up. And it's time. And he's, he's three, so, you know, you know three-year-olds, when do they wake up? Yeah. Most of them, I think, before you do, is <laughs> when they wake up. We went to uh, family camp when he was even littler, and uh, David and Christine were in the tent, and he woke up, and he announced, wake up, the sun is up. The sun was not up, okay? I think it was a quarter to five in the morning. But that, that attitude of the day has started, let's get going. This is why I'm here. Yeah, I, was, I had to sleep, you're forced to sleep, but let's get rolling. That's the attitude here. Wake up. God has created you. Jesus died for you. The Spirit lives in you. Here's another day before you. Get going. Christ is shining on you. And that's, uh, hey, this is a wonderful verse to arrive at on the first Sunday of the year. You know, you can get pretty gloomy, right? As you review 2020 and then you review 2021. The last day of the year, Betty White died. Right? That made many of us sad, feel sad. Of course, she lived to be 99, so that's that's not terribly sad to live to be 99, but you can just focus on the negative. Um, you know, I've started being a little more careful, like probably for the next four or six weeks, because the Omicron variant is easily caught. I'm not scared of it. I'm just wearing my mask a little more and not shaking hands for a few weeks. But, you know, I don't know. Maybe I'll start doing that every January just because of the flu or whatever. So I'm not scared of it. I'm just... But you could focus on that. What's your life about? My life is about wearing a mask and not shaking people's hands, and, and it's about disasters, and it's about, you know, bad news, and it's about how everything is. I talked to another person uh, two days ago who, who just, they started talking, and they said, uh, they started talking about how awful um, the world is and how there's no hope for our country, and they just, they were so gloomy and... I just, I felt like I had to share a little bit of this whole, uh, hey, wake up and rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you, optimism. Now, we should face things that are difficult, certainly, but I kind of said to him, what are you talking about? Our country has been through so many things, so many things. I mean, we got our independence, and then we were on the razor's edge of losing it when England came and said, oh, yeah, you won the last war, watch this. <laughs> and, we went through um, many different wars and bad decisions on our part. Our country has been through slavery and civil war and a world war in Europe, number one, and a world war across the whole planet, you know, World War II, and um, thinking that somehow that it made sense, that separate but equal, you know, black people, you can eat there but not there. I mean, the 60s, you remember the 60s? Assassinations and protests and... And so I just said to him, I don't know what you're talking about. Our country has been through lots of things. We're going to be fine. We need to face up to issues and pray and be involved and, and everything, but don't get so gloomy. Uh, for one thing, some of the things that he was concerned about are just not that important. They're not the main thing. You know, what's exciting about coming to church is you get connected each week to the main thing. You get to praise the creator of the universe. You're reminded that he is your father and he loves you. You get to say thank you to Jesus for dying for you so that all your sins could be forgiven. You get to look forward to the life you will live forever in his presence. You get to recognize that the Spirit, the God's Spirit, is a seal on your heart and that he gives you direction and guidance. You get to be reminded that no matter how dark things is, how my, no matter how dark things become, the darkness is as light to God. It's not dark to him. And this is the place where we can come and sing about this and pray about it and encourage one another. And then you have your own personal darkness or sorrow in your own life, your personal tragedy. And this is a place where you can come and that tragedy, it's not any less sad, but it can be put in perspective. You know, uh, when my father died, 
it was good to be back here with the people of God singing his praise, putting my father's death into perspective. People have come back to church after their marriages have ended. And their lives have been devastated at the end of their marriage, but they have put that in perspective of all that God has done for them and all that will be done for them and the amazing thing of who they are as a child of God and and, um, the realization that you sit next to people who have their sorrows as well and have brought them to God, a lifetime of sorrows. And it's, um, it's a way to face a new year with other people who are awake and walking in love and walking in light. Well, this section ends uh, by talking about walking in wisdom. Verse 15 says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And so he talks about walking in wisdom. And then he talks about time. He's dealing with some big concepts here, isn't he? Light and time. And, you know, we only have so much time to use. It's part of the reason why you want to be as wake, awake as much as you can, engaged in things that matter, because you only have so much time and then it's gone. Um, AJ and Melissa brought over their new child, our new grandchild, Wes. Um, they've just been, you know, away from people for a few weeks with a new baby, and, you know, this is a hard time of year because of illnesses to be around. Here's my baby. Please hold my baby. <laughs> so we got to see Wes for the first time. And I got to do the thing of just holding him where the baby's just sleeping and then sort of wakes up a little and moves around and then goes back to sleep. Isn't that just the most wonderful thing almost that you can do? Such a wonderful, wonderful thing. And, you, and you, when you're holding a, well, a grandchild especially, you're reminded again about how fast time goes and how you have to take the opportunities as they come. And there's two ways to think about time. One is you only have so much of it. That's one way to think about time. Uh, Another is opportunity. Paul says, make the most of every opportunity. Because that's another way that we think about time. You have things that are opportunities. They come, and then they're gone, right? You still may have 10 or 20 years left, but that opportunity will not come back again. It was available then, and then it's gone. And Paul encourages the believers here in Ephesus to make the most of every one of those opportunities and not waste them or use them. There's a deep, deep wisdom in that, right? As a parent, when you have a five-year-old, there are certain things you can do with a five-year-old to encourage them and be with them and everything. Um, Those don't come back when they're 15, okay? When my children were 15, they did not act the same as when they were five. When they were five, when I came home, it was like, Daddy's home, Daddy! ah!" Big hugs and hugs and chasing around, and I'm a monster, and they're beating me up and all that kind of stuff. Uh, That did not happen when they were 15, okay? (laughs) You have an opportunity that's there, and then it vanishes. Make the most of those. Uh, And make the most of the time that you have, because that time evaporates. So, living life fully awake. Awake, O sleeper. Arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Uh, There's a lot of encouragement here from Ephesians starting the new year. Um, I haven't really given us any time to think during this message, actually. In the next message, I need to give people time to think about these things um, because there's a lot here. So, a question that I could ask myself as I read through this, I mean, uh, honestly, it's too much for me to think How do I walk in love? How do I walk in the light? How do I walk in wisdom? I would encourage you to maybe ask the Spirit to speak to you on one of these. Are you distant from God's love by pursuing happiness somewhere else? Have you become fixated on this will make me happy or that will make me happy, even to the point of doing something wrong, impure? Is there a lustful desire that I must have this to be happy? Do I need to find myself resting in God's love? Well, becoming thankful is a path to that, thanksgiving. 
walking in light? You know, am I partnering myself with things actually that are darkness? Do I need to, uh, the way that I act and speak, does this need to project light into the, my relationships, my family, my coworkers? Am I projecting light? Am I light to them where I'm at? Or am I drawing other people to Christ? Um, am, I living in, <laughs> am I living fully in the light that's given me? Am I like the trees, tasting light so that I produce fruit? And then lastly here, walking is wise. Am I using the time I have left wisely? Are there opportunities coming up in the next few weeks? And I realize, hey, if I don't, if I don't act on that opportunity, that actually will probably be gone. If I don't do this this year, I might not have a, an opportunity to ever do this. That's making the most of, of time. Every opportunity, because the days are evil. Well, I hope you feel encouraged, because uh, your Father loves you. Jesus gave his life for you. The Holy Spirit has sealed your heart and gives you direction and comfort. And um, it is, uh, I'm going to say one more thing. If you feel right now like, well, these words are all nice, but I am really struggling. I don't know if God can help me. I don't know if I can measure up. I don't know if, if there's something wrong with me because I have so many struggles. I just want you to pay attention to the obvious is there's a reason why it's in Ephesians. What is the reason why it's here? Because we all struggle. That's why it's here. It's not here to highlight how awful you are. Okay, it's here to highlight the fact that we all struggle and you need to get closer to God the Father and follow Jesus and depend on the Spirit's power. That's why it's there. We all need that message. Let's pray. Father, we thank you very much for the time that we have had in your word today. And I do pray, Father, that uh, you would encourage each of us through your spirit to walk in love, walk in the light, be the light, walk in wisdom. Give us the encouragement to live our life fully awake this year and not seek darkness, not seek sleep, but to be awake in you and for Christ to shine on us. In Jesus' name, amen.